We're very pleased today to be welcoming um, Associate Professor Ewan Miller to speak to us on what is, I think everyone will recognise, a very hot topic, which is artificial intelligence and its particular application in anatomical uh, pathology. So I've been talking to Ewan on and off around um, the statewide biobank over a couple of years. And when I, I think it sort of occurred to me that, you know, his research interest is very clearly based around the use of AI and pathology. And I thought he would be a fantastic speaker to talk to us about um, developments in this space and how they are relevant to pathology, um, potentially biobanking and research more broadly. Um, so, uh, so you, Ewan has just told me that he's originally from Scotland, which I think you will realise um, when you hear him speak. Um, yep, just if people could stay on mute, that'd be fantastic. Um, and he is currently a senior staff specialist here to pathology with New South Wales Health Pathology, and he's based at St George uh, Hospital, and he's also affiliated with the University of New South Wales. Um, he'll be telling us about uh, his recent work in this area and also telling us more broadly about what the future might look like in terms of AI applications in anatomical pathology. Uh, so I think we'll certainly have time for plenty of discussion after the talk. If you've got questions, you're either very welcome to add those to the chat or please um, at the end, you know, I might ask people to put up their hands and we can call on you to ask uh, any questions that you'll have to Ewan. But Ewan, once again, thanks very much for your time and we're really looking forward to your seminar. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and thanks uh, for the invitation to speak to everybody today about AI, which is kind of a pet topic of mine. Um, so just the outline of what I'm going to talk about is just a sort of it's more of a journey, really. I've sort of been involved in this sort of space for the last four, nearly five years now. It just seemed to me it was kind of an interesting area to get into. So just a bit, bit of background, digital pathology, image analysis tools and how I got into it and then sort of more broadly about how AI works in pathology, how you do it. And then sort of finishing on sort of current uh, sort of tools that are available and a, a fellowship that I was fortunate to get, which has sort of just ended. But I've spent the last two years working with Paige for a big AI company in New York. So I've been doing that remotely for Sydney. Uh, for the past couple of years. Um, so that's been very useful in this space and sort of learning all about it. But um, just a couple of disclosures, just of course, first to say the most important one here is um, I've got limited understanding about computer science and AI, so you can be involved. You don't really have to know anything about coding. You just got to know the principles of, of how it all works and you can certainly get involved in this area. And obviously just to make it clear that I do have a research collaboration with Paige moving forward. So I do talk quite a bit about um, my work in that area. So back to the, you know, where we are at the moment. So traditional anatomical pathology like microscopes, you know, are they going to become antiques? The answer, I guess, probably yes, in the next five to 10 years. You know, the way we've been doing pathology has not really changed significantly in the last 150 years. You know, we're still using dyes, staining tissue, looking down a microscope. You can see Ramon Cajal, who is a famous Spanish neuroscientist and pathologist here. He's kind of got the Friday afternoon, five o'clock appearance on your face, a bit disjointed and a bit unhappy having been looking down a uh, a microscope for long hours of the day and you know he got the Nobel Prize for medicine over 100 years ago for his work on neurosciences, Purkinje cells and other things that he discovered. But really when you think about what we do today it's not really that different. You can this is my desk here it's in George so there's just piles of slides, um, a light microscope, a, a sort of simple computer interface and we're still looking at the same sort of blue and purple slides to work out morphological and sort of moving forward with molecular diagnoses as well. But thinking about how things have changed, we're kind of moving into what people are describing as the third revolution in, in pathology or anatomical pathology. Um, just before I got into pathology, and again, you know, this is going back into the, the, the mid 80s when immunohistochemistry first was introduced, everybody thought, you know, this is going to be the end of the pathologist. We don't need them. We've got IHC. This is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. Wasn't the case. It all happened again with the genomics revolution in the early 2000s. You know, we'll get a genomic fingerprint of tumours. We can do fish. We don't need pathologists. Wasn't the case. And again, everybody's talking now digital pathology and AI. 
are we going to get rid of pathologists? We don't need pathologists. And again, that's not going to be the case. You can just speak to a radiologist. The radiologists are still, you know, using uh, are still required. You still need humans to work with these interfaces. So I don't think it's going to be any different. It may th make things, you know, more efficient, but you're still going to need uh, pathologists to get involved. So before you can get into AI, we need to know all about digital pathology because you can't do AI on glass slides, obviously. So digital pathology is happening. It's moving forward all over the place. We're kind of a bit behind the curve at the moment. But basically all you're doing with a digital scanner is you're putting the microscope inside a, an electronic box here. This is a, a scanner that we have in our department. That's a Roche DB200. And you can scan these slides digitally using high resolution scanning. So in about a minute or so, you can take our standard glass slide and you can convert it into a two to three gigabyte whole slide image in a minute or so. But this has got a bucket load of data in it. And this is what you really need to, to play around with. So this is really changing the way that pathology is going to be um, performed in laboratories and microscopes are going to disappear slowly and they're going to be replaced by screens, as you can see here, and a very tidy desk, no mess, no slides, all very organized, very relaxed looking pathologist here. So maybe that will be the case. We'll be much happier and less stressed when we've got these tools in our hands. So this has kind of happened in the background of, of significant improvements in digital scanning technology. Uh, sort of eight to ten years ago and there was a very early uptake especially in Scandinavia and the Netherlands uh, and parts of Europe uh, and more so in the UK sort of 2018-2019 with the uptake of digital and setting up big digital uh, centers of excellence um, and the other thing which has happened as well has been significant improvements in AI and computational power from about 2010-2012 when the first sort of deep learning network which was called AlexNet sort of started to appear in the literature so this is all kind of building together at the same time to sort of take us forward. And um, so about, you know, about five years ago, I sort of started getting interested and I was talking to people that I knew in the UK that were sort of involved. Um, and they all said, you know, you're going to start playing around with QPath. So QPath is this open source machine learning software that you can download. There's a whole community of people out there that use it. You can basically, I taught myself how to do it. If you're a researcher, you may well have already used it, but it's a fantastic tool um, to do, you know, automated machine learning um, assessments of H&Es or immunohistochemistry, multiplex immunofluorescence. You can do it on uh, whole slide images or TMAs. Um, there are online tutorials on YouTube you can use as well. So it's a great tool to get into the space and start trying to work out how these things actually work. Now, the only downside is it's it's not the most uh, sort of user friendly or intuitive interface. This is what it looks like. You can build a machine learning classifier in under a minute and you can run it over slides. This is what I used to do when I was trying to get some cheap and easy data to sort of quantify key 67 expression in, in breast cancers in response to treatment. So you can train it up into each of these, you know, different classes by just annotating and telling it what you thought it was, tumor, stroma, etc. Um, and very quickly, you can take a whole slide and use your tumor. You can highlight the bit you want to train, uh, draw in little annotations, and then convert that into these sort of pixelated images, little cartoons, and it converts all the different cells into, you know, positive, negatives, tumor, stroma, and then it will spit out a bucket load of data very quickly. So you can do a key whole slide section of key 67. You know, you get an answer in, you know, four or five seconds. So it's a fantastic resource. OK, but it does it does have some drawbacks because it's only got basic machine learning components inside it. It's not got deep learning, so you can train it quickly. You get data quickly, but anything more complex, you really have to go to another platform. And um, this was just another thing that I did very quickly as well was looking at tumor stroma ratios as well, which was quite a hot topic a couple of years ago. And again, you can do this in whole slide images and TMAs just like we've got here. So kind of once I'd done that, I kind of decided, well, really good into the you know, get into deep learning and try and work out, you know, what's happening there. So one of the uh, the sort of easiest platforms to try and get a hold of is uh, a platform made by a company in Helsinki, a Finnish company called Iphoria. And uh, they have a deep learning platform which you pay a subscription. You can upload your slides and they will give you training and give you assistance and they'll show you how to basically train a classifier. Uh, the example here was again in, in breast cancer, I was trying to train a sort of uh, multi-leveled uh, tissue recognition classifier to train seven different subtypes of tissue, you know, tumor, stroma, tills, normal, uh, breast, fat, vessels, etc. 
Um, so I, I did that over a three month period. The only problem with it is it's extremely pernickety to use. The annotations have got to be very, very precise down to almost pixel level. So if you're drawing around small glands and stroma cells, things like that, it takes a phenomenal amount of time and you need lots and lots of data. So that's one of the drawbacks. The other main drawback as well is it's actually uh, very expensive to use. I burned through about $25,000 of a grant in about two and a half months trying to build this breast tissue classifier that I was trying to do as part of a project. Um, so very expensive um, and you do need lots of support from them as well. So I essentially decided this is going to be too hard moving forward and that I really need to get involved with the computer science guys um, who were locally sort of doing a lot of AI. So that kind of took me up to UNSW. So about the same time I was trying to work out in my own head, you know, image analysis using AI, you know, what's what's actually happening? You know, you've got images going in, you've got, you know, stuff happening in a black box essentially, and then it's spitting out all of this data. You get nice cartoon diagrams and you get a bucket load of numbers, but you know, how how is this actually all happening? So in terms of, you know, machine learning, so we know that AI is just software that can mimic uh, human judgment or intelligence. And machine learning is basically using these complex mathematical models to learn the relationship between your data and whatever your, the outcome is that you're interested in, whether that's a type of tumor, cancer or benign or survival or death, basically depends on your, you know, what the question is. So basically there's this sort of workflow here, which is, you know, you're, you've got your data, you need to do some sort of pre-processing and um, cleaning up the data essentially before you start using it. You'll run it through the algorithm, which will identify features. The features are really, just a measurable bits of data which is unique to the specific problem of your object. Your model is then going to optimize these features and then it's going to make predictions uh, as part of the training process. Now what's good about uh, you know deep learning is that uh, the results that you get um, will iteratively feed back into the model so that there's continuous fine tuning and, and improvement in performance which happens over and over and over again and to increase the performance so you get more and more accurate and better performance of your algorithm. Um, so these bits of data, especially if you're looking at uh, images, obviously distinct colors, shapes, uh, textures, granularity, edges, or specific globe power tissue patterns are things that would be good features. And that helps you distinguish, uh, you know, different objects from each other essentially, or types of tumors or subtypes. Uh, but many of these can often be uninformative. So these are sort of noisy aspects which you want to try and remove. Um, so deep learning is a special subtype of machine learning where you've got lots of these hidden deep layers, which are, you know, the convolutional neural networks everybody talks about. It's a very computationally intensive, uh, sucks up a lot of power and, you know, in a lot of, you know, publications, people actually measure how much power uh, and energy that their algorithms are actually consuming because sometimes these things chug away and you know thousands and thousands of data points over weeks so there is a you know a cost um, in terms of power um, and environmental impact and this sort of work as well which the, you often have to quantify um, but the good thing about deep learning is it needs it avoids the need to put in specific features into the data and it will actually discover features from the raw data itself during the training uh, part of the process. So the main difference really between classical machine learning and deep learning is that in machine learning you usually have a, a what's known as a domain expert. In this case, if it's me, you're a pathologist, you're actually specifying the features to the, the algorithm that you think are important. So if you're dealing with glands or tumor shape or lymphocytes, you're picking those features out and then running those through the algorithm network and then it's producing some sort of output, whether it's a tumor type or benign versus malignant. Now, when you're using deep learning, the machine or the the, the computer is actually working out from the data which features are actually important. So you don't really need to have this step of having somebody doing very detailed annotations, which is, uh, is a benefit, um, which I'll come back and talk about. But in terms of the output of the data, the, another important difference is the amount of data you need to get uh, a good performance or good uh, figures in terms of accuracy out of your algorithm. So traditional machine learning, for example, like what you can do with QPath, with a small amount of data, very quickly learns patterns and it can give you uh, a simple answer on a simple problem very quickly. But with deep learning, you, need, you can get a much 
greater depth of understanding of these problems and you'll get uh, a much better uh, performance output uh, using a deep learning network containing, uh, sorry, compared to classical machine learning. But the only downside is you need a, a ton of data for it to do this. So deep learning outperforms machine learning by multi multitudes essentially, but it needs much more data and computational power to do that. So another thing which is important in all these projects as well is to, to get successful training. You've got to have very good ground truth labels. So essentially we know what's on the slide on the slide is, is definitely what you know it is. It's, it's got to be reviewed, it's got to be checked, um, and you have to know exactly what's on the slide um, in terms of what your question is. So if it's a tumour, you know there's cancer on the slide, um, and if it's benign, you know there's no cancer. So. This affects the amount of data you need for your your uh, the task that you're doing as well. And usually with deep learning, you need lots of data as I said. So that usually means at least several hundred images or patient uh, you know samples to to make it work. It doesn't really work well if you've only got ten or twenty samples. It's just not enough data. So examples of types of labels you might have: you get a pathological diagnosis like invasive cancers of various type or subtype classification, invasive ductal lobular. If you're talking about breast, you may be interested in particular. Uh, grading issues. You might want to develop a, you know, a grading algorithm that you can use um, to replace a human to do it. You can also train these algorithms if you've got mutational uh, profiling or any type of sequence abnormalities you're interested in. It can then associate a morphological phenotype with the presence or absence of a mutation. Um, I'll talk about more in the work we do with PAGE. For example, we identified you could pick up AR mutations in prostate cancer for h and &E's as well. Um, or other things you might want to do is do some sort of survival prediction direct from a slide, which we've done as well. So and essentially what you need to do is you need to compare what the network predicts on a slide with the correct ground truth label. Um, and the closer you get to those being the same, then the better your results are going to be. But you always have to remember if you've got rubbish going in, you're going to have rubbish coming out. It's the same uh, with any of these uh, algorithms. So it's going to be very well rigorously maintained data. So in terms of what's going in, obviously we can see, you know, we've got a picture of a dog, could be a tumour, but this is a, a composite of, of three different colour channels of RGB. And computers see numbers, they don't see colours. Everything has to be converted into three uh, RGB scores between 0 and 255. So black is essentially 0, 0, 0, and white is 255 three times. And then every shade possible under the sun is a different combination of any of these three digits. So essentially, you're pushing large numbers through um, a network. So the convolution itself is this uh, mathematical process where it slides across each of the of the uh, images and it's uh, this is known as feature extraction so it's basically summarizing these pixel values as it moves across and there are different ways of doing this and this is a way of, of summarizing or compressing the data you've got to remember that each whole slide uh, image is about 80,000 by 80,000 pixels so there's millions and millions of data points there that have to be compressed and summarized so this is sometimes is known as dimensionality reduction where you end up with a sort of abstract version of the image you started off with which really uh, captures all the important features and this goes through multiple layers of the convolutional neural network where the each uh, output of one layer forms the input to the next layer and it becomes more and more compressed and more abstract so it can pick up on subtle things of spatial distances you know granularity colors textures shapes and low power sort of spatial features as well so, you know, to give a sort of simple sort of example, you can see these on the internet. You know, if you've got somebody's face and you're trying to work out who it is, as it, the data gets compressed and sampled and you're extracting features, you're picking out certain things that are characteristic of this particular individual or a tumor whole slide image. You know, this person may have very distinctive eyes or a shape of a nose, which make it, you know, definitive to that particular entity. So when you arrive at the output layer, you know it's definitely George and it's not Albert or anybody else. So it's the same process that you go through for cats and dogs, or if you want to try and, you know, identify different types of tumors, it's just what the labeling is essentially. 
So once you get into the actual computational pathology workflow, um, this is kind of what happens. So as I said, a whole slide image is just too big to chuck into one of these algorithms. Essentially, what you have to do is they get chopped up into thousands and thousands of tiles. Each of these tiles can be of different sizes of pixels. The standard size that is used is usually about 256 by 256 uh, pixels. So you end up with, you know, if you've got about a database of 500 patients, you'll end up with, you know, 50 or 60,000 of these little tiny tiles. And these tiles are the ones that get fed through the algorithm and get sampled for features essentially. The other thing you do is you split your cohort of data into three different groups. So you use the bulk of it to train your algorithm. You test it on about another 15% uh, and then the last 15% you then validate it. So you're splitting it all up so you can actually test the algorithm to make sure you're not overfitting the data uh, in your training cohort so that it will actually be able to work well in a real world situation where you want to test it on unseen images. Um, and the next thing that follows from that is uh, is this thing called pre-processing. So again, this depends on you know your scanned images. There's lots of different digital scanners on the market, and each of them, if you take the same image, they will produce different shades of pink and blue from an H and E scan. And the first thing you have to do is you have to do what's known as color correction so that you convert all the images into the same uh, shades of pink and blue. So there are no real differences between uh, the different scanners. I mean, most people, if they do a project, will scan on one type of scanner. But if you've got a bigger uh, data set, you may well have, uh, you know, uh, images coming from different institutions uh, which use different scanners, they've got different H&Es from different hospitals, and you end up with a mixed bag of, of colors. Um, so that's part of pre-processing. The other thing that you do as well is to improve the, the training is, is to do what's known as augmentation, where you can take all these little tiles and you can spin them around, you can flip them, rotate them, invert them, um, and that just adds extra power so that the computer can recognize the same thing, whether it's you know the right way up, or it's upside down, or it's back to front. So it's kind of what a pathologist does when he has a biopsy slide on his microscope. They're not, they don't always come the right way up. They're often all over the place. So you've got to re be able to reorientate and recognize different orientations. And then all you do is you match up your, you know, all of these features with your, the, the output um, that you might be interested in. For example, you might just want to know if this is a, a survival thing. You might want to be able to predict survival from these H and E slides. Um, and then you take, you know, your ground truth labels. You compare uh, the predictions with the ground truth, and then you come up uh, with your uh, parameter, which is the area under the curve, the UC, which is used to sort of assess how well your algorithm is performing. Um, and as I said, this this uh, you know feedback process where you iteratively improve uh, the process goes on. You can run this training over about twenty thousand times um, to minimise the error between the predictions and the actual ground truth. So this is known as the loss function uh, process. If you want to get into the sort of lingo of, of computer science. So when you get your performance matrix, the uh, the area under the curve of the uh, receiver operator curve here gives you the sort of idea of how well you're performing. If you've got about 0.5, that's basically uh, flipping a coin. You really want to be getting up to at least 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And if you're going for a clinically uh, useful algorithm, one you want to get into clinical practice, it's going to be close to 98, 99%. Because really, if you're if you're dealing with patient samples, you really want to be close to perfect. You don't really want to be missing any cases, so that's one of the difficulties involved in clinical AI at the moment. So who, who do you need, really need on your computational pathology team? Well, um, obviously you need high level computer science skills, so you need people who can code, people who've got high level math skills, doing lots of linear algebra, advanced calculus, and can use programs such as Python, PyTorch, and TensorFlow, which are all the deep learning uh, software programs that uh, are used to run these algorithms. Um, so we've got uh, very high skilled people that I work with at the UNSW, which I'll, I'll tell you more about in a minute, but they're all really young kids doing their PhD, a lot of them from overseas who've come to Australia and are, are really fantastic, uh, very super clever uh, young people, and um, it's been really good fun working and learning from them. Um, and obviously our pathologist, if you're doing an image-based project, which is what we're doing at the moment, where really you need somebody to identify a clinical uh, issue or a question that needs to be addressed, you need to do some sort of annotation assess the outputs and then work out how this thing is actually working and is it any good. 
Um, and as I said, you don't really need to be able to, to understand how an engine works to drive a car, and it's the same for AI. Uh, you're as a pathologist you're required to use your pathologist skills not really to get involved in any of the coding because it is so complex um, you really you, you really need a degree in it so in terms of what we're doing at the moment I've been collaborating with Eric Meiring who's uh, a Dutch computing science expert he's part of the the big pathology groups uh, he trained uh, in the Netherlands and he's been or in Sydney for about the last four or five years. So at the moment we've got three PhD students, so the Pumi, Mamanur and Rack team. Uh, they've been working on different aspects of breast cancer using some of our local breast cancer cohorts from St George and also the publicly available TCGA data sets which also have molecular data with them. And they've been pumping out papers in the last couple of years who've been looking at, you know, most of these are things that we can do from H and E slide, like predicting survival in triple negative breast cancer, looking at tissue microenvironment analysis and outcome using multiplexed immunofluorescence. Uh, Maminer has been looking at spatial transcriptomic predictions from H and E slides, and he's now moving on to subclassifying different types of breast lesions and pre-invasion lesions on H and E slides as well. Um, and Rack team has been working on doing PAM50 gene expression, subtyping, and multimodal risk prediction in ER positive breast cancer. So it's it's a busy space. We've got a lot of things happening, um, but that's been a hugely sort of informative area for me because I consider it on all the computer science discussions, and uh, it's you know slowly I, I pick up stuff, so I know how to ask them tricky questions when I need to. So, you know, one of the things I you kind of get to grips on, you know, all these different types of, of neural networks, they've all got funny names. Usually the people who build them name them after themselves. AlexNet, there's VGG, ResNet, InceptionNet, GoogleNet. And really, you know, you think, oh, I really don't know what's going on here. Which which one do we, use, do we need to use? And of course, it depends on the task, but essentially you just ask the computer scientists because they will tell you, well, what type of problem is it? Is a is it a classification problem? Is it a regression problem? Or do we want to segment, you know, a bit of tumor on a slide? How are we going to do this? So there are different uh, approaches. You know, these heavily supervised um, approaches is where you need, really need to draw around, do lots of uh, annotations on a slide. That is hugely time consuming. And if you've got, you know, 500 or 1,000 slides that need to be annotated, you're just not going to get a pathologist to do it. So for the most part, what we've been doing, we used a technique using uh, called weekly supervised learning or multiple instance learning, which really only needs, you only need to know basically that if you have a slide that there's cancer somewhere on that slide or if it's benign, you need to know that it's completely benign on a slide level, not down to the specific labeling the tissue. That saves a lot of time and effort, but it's actually um, very accurate. And there are other uh, techniques known as unsupervised learning and transfer learning, um, which, uh, you know, you can read up on about, but uh, essentially, you know, always ask the scientists, they'll tell you which one we need to do. So, you know, what, what do we do with all of these applications? So what can we use them for? So currently, and I'll come and talk about this a little bit more, um, the commercially available ones is basically developing decision assisting sort of software for clinical practice. So detecting cancer on a slide, subtyping cancers, grading cancers, counting mitoses, quantifying uh, biomarkers, especially in breast, ER, PR, K67, HER2. These are all kind of things that are already up there and there's multiple companies doing this already. And uh, this sort of takes this part of the of the diagram here. But sort of more in the research space, but this is going to be more important moving forward in the next five or 10 years is really um, getting into personalized medicine, predicting disease outcomes, risk profiles, choices of targeted therapies, choosing therapies that are going to really uh, be optimal uh, for, for outcomes and good responses. Um, as I've mentioned, you can screen for genomics or mutational profiles, helps you to enrich you know, massive populations of slides and pull out those that are going to be worthwhile and doing this very quickly and cheaply for downstream molecular testing. Some expensive multi-gene tests like Oncotype DX or PAM50, you can do on glass slides as well for a fraction of the cost. And obviously you get the result in a few minutes, not six weeks later. So this is gonna have a, a big impact on the way medicine is uh, practiced, I think down uh, the line. Um, and it's it's going to really change the way we practice. So, you know, just to show you, there was this landmark paper about two years ago in Nature Cancer, uh, showing really the prince, proof of principle that uh, you can identify uh, mutations across different types of cancers uh, to various extents. Obviously, these were all done on TCGA, uh, and obviously it depends on the number of cases and the number of, of mutations you have in your cohort. So. 
when you look at the ORAC here again, and some of them aren't particularly high, and a lot of them are below this sort of uh, false discovery rate cut point that you really need to be above. But you can see those sort of common things, TP53 and PIK3CA, and MAP kinase often are the ones that pop up especially in bread. So there's only a handful there. They've got a sort of semi-reasonable uh, ORAC of, you know, about 0.7. Again, here, gastric probably a little bit better performing. And then we've got all these in breast here. We've got all these different uh, genomic signatures where you've got multiple different genes making up the signature. And again, the ORAC, some of them aren't particularly great, but it's a proof of principle. You know, if you're getting up to 0.8 or 0.9 for some of these signatures, then potentially there's, you know, room for improvement and uh, something you can work on um, down the line. So that kind of took up, took me up to about 2020 uh, and beyond. And at that point in time, there was a, a call for a grant application essentially through MRFF, which I put in for, and I nearly fell off my chair when I got the call to say, well, you've got one. So what they did with what was known as the Research and Exchange and Development and Industry Fellowships, the Ready Fellowships, was to take uh, researchers and put them into the sort of med tech sector, get them working with a big industry partner uh, for a couple of years or so, and then really take that experience and bring it back to your research organization that you're working for. So, you know, clinicians could apply as well. So I thought, okay. Let's give it a go. I made a few calls and spoke to Paige um, and, you know, we managed to come up with a project and we were fortunate to get funding. So I was doing this remotely from home and um, it just the funding actually just ran out a few weeks uh, ago. Um, so three days a week, I would be online speaking to, to Paige. So Paige, if, if you haven't heard of them, they're a world leading uh, software company based in Times Square in New York. Um, they have a essentially a global footprint now. They've got uh, the company. I think there's only actually about 10 people in New York. Everyone else is all over the States and Europe um, and North America and South America. Um, and they basically are the one of the biggest and probably market leading uh, digital pathology AI vendors. And they've got the only FDA cleared clinical pathology AI product, which is called Page Prostate, which detects prostate cancer with a very high level of sensitivity. Um, so I got involved with their team and essentially they were a spin-off from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is the world famous oncology hospital in New York. And they have uh, access to all of their glass slides and they basically get them all scanned uh, from the hospital and they've got access to, you know, at the moment, I think it's probably up to about six million glass slides. And these are all reviewed by, you know, world famous experts. They get a lot of uh, cases which are sent in from all over the world for second opinions. So they get access to a wide variety of stain quality and uh, different diagnoses and things like that, which they feed into their training. So they've got a huge database um, of glass slides and they also have access to their MSK Impact, which is a 468 gene oncogene uh, sequencing panel of actionable mutations, which they have on about 20 or 30,000 of the patients as well as having the glass slides. So they have access to all of that. And on top of this, they also have massive computational power. So they can do a lot of stuff over a weekend and believe me, um, I almost fell off my seat when, you know, we were talking about what we we're going to do and I thought, well, that's going to take months and, you know, a lot of it got done in three days. So um, in terms of the, what's happening in, in commercial AI, this is an old slide from, you know, three years ago. And there was a handful of companies, you know, one of the first was Iphoria, which we talked about, and Path AI, Ibex, who are sort of also quite a big company, and then Page appeared as a spin-off by 2018. Um, but since then, this is what it looks like now. There's probably another 20 or 30 companies. Um, I sort of tried to keep up, but it's just mind boggling. Usually every month there's at least one or two new companies will appear because there's a big market out there and not all of these guys are going to survive. The big ones are going to swallow up some of the smaller ones. Some of these companies only tend to work with uh, big biopharma companies. They're not really getting into the clinical space like Page uh, and Ibex are doing, um, but there's a lot of competition out there. So we'll just have to see how it all turns out. So in terms of what's possible with, uh, you know, these commercial uh, cancer detection algorithms, this is the Ibex Gallon uh, system here, which is just an example of, of what it looks like. So they, you know, have a very highly accurate uh, invasive breast cancer detection system. They again use a different type of uh, AI to what Page use. They use more pathologist built annotations. They had a team of about 200 pathologists who were drawing around glands and, you know, very finely annotating things. Page use a different approach of using multiple instance learning where they can just uh, give the algorithm, you know, benign slides and cancer slides, and then the algorithm will work out 
which bits is actually cancer from the pixel uh, data, which is uh, a big task. And so this is what it looks like. Essentially, you get this heat map. So the, the red implies a very high likelihood of cancer, and then it sort of cools off to a blue zone. Anything which is negative is not invasive cancer. So this is the sort of stuff that if you're using it day-to-day -day practice that you will get uh, presented with. Um, and there's different ways that you can present the data to and sort of to the user interface to the pathologist. So in terms of um, what Page have and what I was involved in doing, I was uh, sort of largely involved in building the Page Breast Suite. Uh, there was various things which were underway when I when I joined the company a couple of years ago. Um, and the other thing I was involved in was in developing digital biomarkers. So mutation prediction from prostate cancer was one thing we got involved in um, and predicting antigen receptor mutations from an H&E slide so you can enrich screening populations. So things that are currently available again, cancer detection and subtyping, you know, ductal lobular, all the pre-invasive atypias and DCIS, breast sentinel node, um, detecting mitoses and invasive cancer for grading, uh, detecting HER2 expression from H&E slides, and then AI-enabled quantification of the usual biomarkers. And um, there's a similar product for prostate cancer, but still the main time-saving advantages, especially for sentinel load and prostate cancers for a pathologist, this is involves wading through. Uh, for prostate cancer, you could have up to 70 or 80 slides of one, pa and one patient, and you may only end up finding, you know, a single one millimeter focus of cancer. So the page prostate algorithm, which was trained on over 32,000 whole slide images from about 8,000 patients and sampled across 800 institutions across the globe, um, negative predictive value is 99%. I don't think it could get any higher than that. So basically, if the algorithm doesn't find cancer, you know that there's not going to be cancer on the slide. So it allows you to uh, quickly find what you're looking for, order any IHCs and save a lot of time and anguish going through lots and lots of slides and levels and doing immunistic chemistry. So it's 99 percent specific for cancer and this product is the only one which is currently FDA approved it's the only one on the market so we'll very quickly take you this is the FDA approved version which has got the crosshairs this is what they had to do to get FDA approval and um, the other non FDA approved version has got a different sort of user interface but if you want that one this is what it looks like and it gives you this little uh, pop-up box here. It will tell you focus of interest. It gives you the detection. It tells you there's a sus suspicious tissue heat map. And that's the little icon here, which you press on to get the AI output. Um, and the other thing it does as well is it will grade and it will quantify the cancer on the slide. So it will automatically measure where it thinks the cancer is. It will highlight, you can see here, it sort of pales out the benign tissue and leaves in a, a nice clear H&E where the invasive cancer is, and then it will actually grade it. So you can see the percentages here, pattern three and pattern four, and it gives you the Gleason score, three plus four equals seven. And it tells you that 53.15% of the core is involved. And there's the area of carcinoma, and it measures 7.18 millimeters. So these are things that you would actually have to do manually or attempt to do manually on each biopsy. Um, and then for one patient, you can have up to 20 24 sites. So you, you can spend a lot of time uh, sort of doing vague calculations which are not particularly accurate, but they take uh, a bit of time to do before you format the report. So um, similarly to that, you know, if you've got breast sentinel nodes, you can spend ages going through lots and lots of, of slices of lymph node trying to find a little deposit, which is, you know, one or one and a half millimeters. The big deposits, again, you can find easily, but the micromets take a lot of time. So the sensitivity for their sentinel node detection here is nearly 98%, negative predictive value 95. And again, these are trained on large numbers of slides, 32,000 whole slides images of uh, lymph nodes. Um, another thing again we're recently that we worked on was developing uh, mitotic uh, detection. This is important for grading breast cancer. And again, it's one of those time consuming tasks that if you can automate it, you can save a lot of time. What pathologists have to do uh, for each breast cancer is you have to assess and find the hotspot or the area where there are the greatest number of mitoses in an area of approximately two millimeters, which in the old days used to be 10 high prior field. So, Using this algorithm which Page developed, they will actually find the hotspot and it will tell you where it is, it will highlight it and it will actually give you the score in the hotspot. 
Um, you obviously then have to review each one and make sure that you agree with, uh, you know, is this definitely a mitosis? There are some issues around, uh, you know, look like things that can look like mitosis. So all you should do is just confirm the number and then you're done basically. So that can save a lot of time. So just also to say that if you're interested in doing this, page offer a free trial. If you want to get online, if you're interested in, in having a look at it, you can play around with it yourself. Just go to this uh, website here and just register your email address and you'll get access if you want to use it and look at it and see it uh, up close and personal. So in terms of where we are and uh, current problems and barriers, these are the main sort of areas. I think uh, access to sufficient training data is a big problem. In order, if you want to get very high performances for clinical use, well, you need to get an area under the curve of, you know, at least 0.95 or 0.99 if you're going to get regulatory approval. It's a bit of an issue. So I think going forward, there's going to have to be bigger and larger collaborations between, you know, healthcare uh, systems, uh, industry. You nearly need to lots of high quality data, but that in itself brings ethical and legal issues around confidentiality, access, safety, IP, etc. So one way that you can actually get around this is to use a, a training uh, pattern, which is known as federated learning, where you can actually take your algorithm and take it into the local environment, train your algorithm locally, but export only the results of your model weights from each site. So you could have a collaboration that could be in five different hospitals, different jurisdictions around the world. You can uh, put in your training algorithm into that domain. You can export your, your, your results and then you can use that to, to build your final model. So none of the actual original data leaves that jurisdiction. So that's one way that people are looking at at the moment. But obviously not getting enough data can lead to biases as well. So certain institutions may have certain ethnic populations and it may be better at detecting or under detecting uh, different types of lesions in different populations. So that's another thing we have to get around. And all of this all feeds into generalizability. So generalizability is how well your model performs on unseen data from another institution or a different geographic location. So we really need lots of real world studies to test AI in different environments, different glass, different glass H&E uh, uh, &E slides. What does it actually do? How does it perform? Does it do what it says on the box? Um, and one of the other barriers, of course, is, is actually going digital because you know, as I said, you can't do AI on glass slide. You've got to go digital. So you need all the IT infrastructure and uh, protections, uh, cloud, hardware, uh, software, data storage um, is a big issue. So it's a big investment. You know, New South Wales Health Pathology, we're already going down this pathway. We've been talking about it for the last uh, two or three years. And, you know, it's going to be in excess of 50 million to get it off the ground to start the roll towards, um, you know, a statewide uh, digital service. So. Uh, and then that doesn't even include running AI. Obviously, AI is going to cost. And at the moment, nobody's really sure how much this is going to be. And is it going to be reimbursed by Medicare? I think this will have to happen down the line because of the improvements and the time taken to invest in digital and running AI. There's going to be a reimbursement for the hospitals that are going to be using it. So um, part of the downside, I think, of using AI is, you know, dealing with the humans. So, you know, the they say that you know pathologists that use AI will replace those pathologists that don't want to use AI. The problems are though, you know, what's going to happen? De-skilling, de-thrilling, you know, is the computer going to be taking away some of the cases you would normally report and just leave you with all the difficult ones and then you're going to end up with, you know, pathologists burning out because you're just going to be left with really difficult, challenging cases. All those gallbladders and appendices will get reported by the robots and you'll just be left with all these really difficult soft tissue tumours and undiagnosable things that need, you know, 100 immunostains to diagnose. Um, and how is this going to affect registrar training? You know, these are all things that, you know, the college will have to get involved in and we're going to have to draw up policies to discuss and uh, work this all out. Um, another important issue is explainability. Sometimes it's, it's just abbreviated to XAI. You know, how is the model making its decisions? How does it work? I mean, this is important, I think, for developing trust in whatever AI system you decide to use. And also, if you're going to get regulatory approval, you know, there are already guidelines about how the software uh, is going to be, uh, the code is going to be written. How is it, you know, is it all locked down properly? Um, how is it actually making decisions? What was the training data? 
data that was used. This is all going to be built into the application to get regulatory approval. So you've got to have a lot of transparency. And if you're building this stuff, you have to do this from the ground up. So uh, this is kind of stuff that Page were heavily involved in um, and getting all their products through. So kind of uh, where we're up to now, this is a uh, a, a good sort of cartoon diagram that I had sort of put aside from a couple of years ago and I thought, oh, well, this will be interesting if we can get all of this. But in fact, all of this is now already doable. So the benefits of using an AI-enabled, you know, lab laboratory workflow is essentially the, the workflow efficiencies to automate simple tasks so you can automatically prioritize cases. You can scan, you know, for ones that have got cancer, push them to the top of the pathologist work list. You can QC for poor scan quality, get them redone. You can pre-order it for immunohistochemistry or levels before the pathologist has even set his eyes on it. And you can actually take, uh, you know, a presumptive diagnosis that the system can make. It can start pre-populating your synoptic reports for you. So in fact, by the time you open up the case, all the immunistic chemistry can be ordered. It can be there in front of you. It can already be loaded into your synoptic report so that you can essentially just go through, tick it off and say, that's good, that's good, I agree with the grade or change a few things you're not happy with and then you can just get rid of it. So I think the opportunity there to, to improve turnaround times is massive. And the other thing that does as well is allows you to select uh, cases and slides for MDTs, which is a huge time waster for all pathology labs as well. Um, and faster screening times, especially when you're looking for rare events, so prostate cancer and breast central node, you can speed that up significantly. Um, and overall, it really you know, offers a chance to improve diagnostic ac accuracy um, as well. Fewer misses of smaller lesions, and it could also run QA checks in the background. So, you know, you could say, well, let's take all your negative prostate cores for the last month. If you haven't been using AI or whatever to report them, let's get them all checked and see if the machine finds anything and get them reviewed if there's any discrepancies. So it just raises the whole uh, level of, of, of performance across the board. Um, so just uh, getting close to finishing here because we're running out of time, so we've got time for questions. I think moving forward, um, and this is already happening, some of our own students are already doing what is known as multimodal deep learning, where you're actually combining the image with molecular data, the radiology and the clinical. This has actually been shown to have much uh, improved prognostic power over molecular features alone, especially in breast, lung and colon. And what you can also do is integrate these with what, what's known as large language models of AI, which can actually dissect through swathes of text. It's almost like reading books and it can pull out critical pieces of information and pull them into your model and use them not only for just doing pathology, but clinical decision making and obviously for research tasks. So for things like biobanks, this is going to be a huge game changer to get access to all this sort of data that you can get out of the uh, EMR, which we have, which is going to be a fantastic tool. Um, but in order to go fully digital, though, you've really got to get rid of the glass slide. So I think this is probably going to happen uh, maybe in 10 to 15 years time. There are a number of different techniques that you can use where you don't actually need to cut and stain slides anymore. Uh, one of them is open top light sheet microscopy where you can apart, uh, take the tissue block once it's been fixed and you can clear the tissue out. Um, of the FB, FFP blocks, you can scan it and it will generate images which you can then use AI to do uh, virtual h &E staining. But it also gives you three dimensionality which you don't get from a, a four micron section. So, you know, if you've got a block of tissue which it could be up to four or five millimeters thick, you can actually scan through it like, a, you know, almost like an MRI or a CT scan and you can do three dimensional recreations of tissue which will be a new avenue of of, of research in the future. So this is still a, a bit off yet, but I think once it goes into this sort of state, we can eliminate the glass and then you'll just be left with tissue blocks that you can go back and re-scan and almost paint any color you wish. Um, so, but you know, what, what could go wrong? And this is just, a, you know, there's funny stories on the internet. So if you're a follower of Scottish football, as I do from time to time, one of the smaller clubs in Inverness decided to invest in using AI to automatically detect the soccer ball. But unfortunately, their, their training <laughs> data wasn't that good because the camera kept going back to the, the linesman's bald head because it looked like a soccer ball. So in fact, 
the three goals that were scored in this game were all completely missed by the camera. So you always have to remember it's kind of a, something to bear in mind is thinking about using AI was how was the model trained and uh, what was the data that was used and how good was it? And always remember that human supervision is still going to be required to check the output is actually valid. Um, because you can remember seeing these, I'm sure you've seen these is on the internet, you know, lookalikes, very, very different uh, entities, but look very similar. So you've got to take all this with a pinch of salt and just make sure the humans uh, stay in the loop. Uh, so just to finish, just a few acknowledgements of everybody I work with at Page, I had a great time working there across uh, several different groups and you know different time zones and different parts of the world. They're a fantastic organization. Is very lucky to be involved with them, and also with my collaborators at UNSW and our great uh, supervisors and PhD students. And also thanks again to uh, the MRFF and MTP Connect who are good enough to give me the opportunity to get funded and work with Page. So with that, I'll uh, say thank you and happy to try and answer any questions. Thanks, Hugh, and that was amazing. I feel like I've just learned, I've learned so much. Um, <laughs> and particularly, yeah, thanks for sort of describing the difference between machine learning and deep learning. I think I was probably just nodding um, benignly when people would use those terms, and now I feel like they've actually, I've actually understood. Dan, I would have been very disappointed if you had no questions, so please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, great talk, and and uh, you've you've echoed what's been going on in my mind for, for many years, and, and I think it's got, and that was fabulous. It was really good. Um, the question I have, and, and I've always come back to, is that the idea of a gold standard, and our gold standard is the human eye, the pathologist, but we all know that pathologists are human, therefore they're not perfect. So the golden eye is a little tarnished. Um, the golden standard is tarnished. So why do we in our deep learning models and our machine learning approaches um, want to push those models to 100% um, accuracy, 100% precision um, as on the basis of what the pathologist is telling us, would it not be helpful to have an, a, a, a computer-based uh, digital model, um, AI-driven model that tells us one story with a degree of accuracy that we feel is, is competent and compare that to the human's version of the story, which and they're trained to a degree of competency, which we trust, and compare the two such that when the computer and the, the human um, agree, then you've got greater certainty around that particular patient's diagnosis. Um, and when a um, computer and the, and the doctor does not, dis or the pathologist does not agree, that's when you might want to have a closer look at the patient and learn maybe there's something going on there that we have not yet, not yet picked up. How do we reconcile that? What is the gold standard? And um, is it really that gold? Yeah, good question. I'm not sure if I can answer it, but um, I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, if you get three pathologists or 10 pathologists in a room and you say, what is this lesion then? You know, three of them will agree, two of them will say, well, it might be something else. And the other three will say, well, I think it's something completely different. So there's a lot of, of subjectivity in pathology. And I think that's something that AI offers in terms of grading of cancers where you can get more uniformity across a system. The problem is trying to get people to agree as to who is right and who is wrong. Because, you know, if you're an expert in GU pathology and I say that's a Gleason pattern four, and the AI has been trained by a different bunch of people in a different institution using different slides, and they've got a different, you know, skewedness yeah, yeah. to say, well, we think that's pattern three. That's just, it's reflect, the AI is going to reflect who it was trained by. So there's no way of, of getting around because essentially, you know, humans are trying to make inferences on biological processes, which we think we understand. We don't fully know. And I think, you know, in the fullness of time, I think, you know, when we add in extra features, especially into multimodal learning, you're going to extract yeah. more than just the images can tell us because they tell you part of the story and they, you know, they summate you know, the proteome and the genome and the lipidome and everything else. It, it only takes you so far and from what we've done, combining different 
data sets tells you more. But again, it depends on the question. If you're after just the diagnosis of morph morphological pattern, which is still the, the, the basis of, of medicine at the moment because it was all built on morphology, all the genomics has come after that and then we've modified it. I think we still have to, you know, you have to listen to the AI, but it's, it's you know, at this point in time, it's still decision assist. It's yeah. going to be, you know, another five or 10 years until we've got bigger data sets from all across the world that are going to be built into really, really rigorous um, algorithms. And I think that will happen as you buy into a system as everybody goes digital. Versions are going to improve iteratively. You're going to say, you know, I reported this prostate on page version 101 back in 2023 and now we're on page version 16.5. And we'll say, well, how do these two compare? And obviously, the newer one, if it's got more data, etc., it's, it's going to be slightly better. So I think, you know, I think what you're saying is true, but I think we still have to keep the humans in the system and expect a degree of subjectivity for a little bit longer. I, I, I would agree, and I think the, you know, the um, you definitely need to keep the humans in there, and and the the uh, AI side of things is going to be assisting and, and the two things are going to work very well together. But I think at the same time, when these two combinations start to work each other out, new things will happen and new ways of seeing seeing patients and new discoveries and those patients that don't normally fall into any group will suddenly emerge as being significant and will understand them. So it has a uh, great potential, but we've it's going to we've got to be prepared for it to open new doorways as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Ideas. So, Thanks, right, Dan. Um, but yeah, we've got a few other questions, so we might just try and squeeze those into the time remaining. Um, Adrian, would you like to ask your question? Uh, thank you. It's a very nice talk. And um, I, I was set, we helped set up a digital path lab in Sidra in, in the Middle East, and now I've come back here and we're just working our forwards here. This is very timely. What do you think the time frame is? Do, uh, if five years, 10 years that breast and prostate cancers will be wanted by the clinicians, by the patients to have AI assess grading or and would it be 19, you know, 95 percent of all prostate and breast cancers in five years or 10 years? What's your foresight? Uh, 10 years, I'd say there aren't any major, you know, there are sort of small studies to show the benefits, but I do think clinicians will and you know, patients especially, I don't think it's, there's going to be enough confidence out there um, until there are larger published studies, which is going to take uh, five years to get all that data out there and then for it to sink in. So I think, you know, what's available at the moment, I mean, there aren't any great breast grading algorithms at the moment. I know uh, some of the companies are working on them. Uh, prostate cancer is obviously was the first kid off the block and it's it's certainly getting closer, but I still think it's going to be some time um, before that is sort of standardized. I think, you know, especially more so for maybe people who are diagnosed outside of major centers. I think, you know, to just to standardize, you know, what is a real pattern for and what isn't, because that's often a decision point around active surveillance versus, you know, intervention is, you know, percentage pattern for, and that's certainly what we spend a lot of time discussing in our lab. Um, so I think it will happen, but it's, it's going to be a while yet, and because obviously labs are going to get digital. So digital first, AI second, I think even going digitally, you're going to get the pathologists on board and being comfortable at reporting digitally, because you're going to go through an accreditation process. And I think if you're trying to do all that and then give them AI, I don't think that's the right way to do it because you'll end up with a bad outcome. I think you need to get pathologists on board with digital first, get them comfortable and then give them the AI because it's a new way of working. And I've been using it for the last two years and you've got to work out how are you going to introduce it? Do you look at the slides or do you go, all right, I'll switch on the AI and they'll say, oh yeah, I've just found it, but what about the rest? Are you going to apply that same level of, of interrogation that you would normally do when you already know the AI has found stuff? So these are questions you've got to work through, but I, I think it'll take 10 years. Thank you. Uh, Hugh. Uh, yes, you, that was a great talk. I was just wondering, uh, you're talking about H&E slides, but has there any, been any sort of discovery or discussion about using it for fish as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some papers. I mean, you can basically 
train it around anything basically i mean you can you know use any color of, of stain that you like even in you know the realms of renal pathology which has got five or six different colors you can use that very successfully and i'm sure um, and we haven't done it on fish ourselves but i know for things like hair to sish where you're doing dual color you there's you know roche have already got an algorithm that does that it will pick 20 cells it will count them mark them all up and it will serve them up to you on a little you know thumbprints on the side so that's already doable and i'm sure for other types of fish as well uh, or rather than you know fish with a bright color i mean the only problems with you know capturing low light intensities is is trying to scan the image which takes hours so you know if you've got low level fish it would take a while to capture it but i'm sure it would be doable thank you uh elizabeth Thanks, Jen. A fantastic talk, um, Ewan. And just to follow up quickly the dying minutes of the meeting, and just to reinforce um, what Dan was raising in terms of the source of truth, I, I think in the short term, AI is certainly going to change the way pathologists work. I think in the long term, it's going to fundamentally change the way we think. And I, I think once this technology and once you have deep learning and everything linked in with mathematical oncology, I think a lot of the things that we think we understand and we think we've got worked out in 2023, I think in 10 years time we're going to have a whole emergent field of oncology that has been, that is AI understood in a way that it was never human understood. And I think that's the revolution in medicine that we've all kind of got to collectively prepare ourselves for. And I I can see Jennifer nodding, but I just wonder what you think, Jan. Oh, no, I think so, because there's, there's even stuff that, you know, talking about things you don't understand that when we did our, you know, survival prediction of, of triple negative breast cancer, there were some features that were strongly predictive of outcome that I couldn't make any sense of. And one of them was cancer infiltrating fat. Now, you would, you would have thought that that was something you see all the time, but this has popped up also. We found it in another paper in colorectal cancer was particular patterns of infiltration in fat by cancer. Now I can tell the difference and I couldn't see anything in it. But to me, it was kind of like, well, I don't understand that. And then you kind of think, well, you know, you can't just put it in the bin just because I don't know what it means. I mean, it must yeah. mean something. So you think, all right, well, that's something we can come back to in 10 years when someone's worked it out. But, <laughs> But there'll be thousands of that because you think a number of features, like if it scans across a whole oh, image, absolutely. it will pick out, you know, 65 million different features that you think, well, it can't all mean something, but, it, you know, and then the machine works out, there's a correlation, but going back and trying to work it out, it's the same with, you know, morphological features associated with a genetic abnormality that... Yeah. That's right. It's already done. Like we've done it in and for androgen receptor mutations in prostate cancer. And you can look at the slide and you can't tell the difference between the ones that are positive and the ones that are negative. Yeah. But there's obviously something in the chromatin or who knows the cytology of the cytoplasm. I don't know. And I but, think they can do that now with EGFR and lung cancers now. They've yeah, got, yeah, they've got yeah, predictions absolutely. for yeah, it's just yeah. mind it's mind yeah. blowing. Yeah. It's sort of like the um you know, Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns, you know, what we don't That's know right. that we don't know. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. We, yeah, we think we know what the future is right. gonna look like. We're yeah. a long way from we really don't. understanding the power yeah. of this. Yeah, we're really just talk, scratching, yeah. The, scratching the surface at the moment. I mean, it's, you know, it's like four years ago when I got involved, I was thinking, I mean, nobody was really that interested, but now it's like, everybody's all over it. And it's just like, the whole thing is like super saturated. There's so many publications and stuff. You, you can't keep up, it's just enormous. We might just squeeze in one last question from Caesar. Thanks, Ewan, for your talk. Um, so from your experience, how seamless can AI be integrated into existing pathology workflows, especially in the public sector? And are there any like ethical considerations we should be aware of when using AI in AP or any other uh, diagnostic field? Um, I think, uh, as I you know mentioned, it's you need to have you know established digital workflows, which for the public health system, you know, 
we're working towards. So uh, the plan is really that this is going to happen after, you know, in, for New South Wales Health Pathology on the backbone of, you know, migrating to fusion, a single um, LIS, which is where the digital is going to work, work out of. So that's that whole process is going to take another three to four to five years before it starts to migrate across the state. And then we can start to work out how to use it. Um, I think once you decide on how you're going to use it and you know what algorithms you're going to get and these are already you know although they come with some regulated approvals most of them are not going to have a full set and then you're going to have to you know test them and improve them in the house essentially for each algorithm to make sure that it does what it says it's going to do and um, so there are ethical problems around that and you know relying on the AI and keeping the pathologist in the loop and also knowing how the algorithm was trained again you know are there any biases in the data things like that or other sort of considerations so I think it you know once we get up in digital it will slowly percolate and it can be done but I think as I said you've got to get everybody on board with digital first and reporting on a screen and getting used to it. I think you can't just let people loose and give them AI straight away because the last thing you want to happen is to take a new tool like this and end up with several disaster stories where people were misdiagnosed or something bad happens and then everybody then fails to trust and then you know the whole thing bottoms out and everyone goes oh AI that was a load of rubbish like what happened and that you know scenario so I think we've got a responsibility to to use it slowly and carefully and then bring it in it's like any new test it's not infallible just like you know if you get any of the chemical stain you don't just one stain says it's cancer you've got to look at it. it's got to fit you've got to be happy with the result because at the end of the day you'll be signing out yourself so you've got to be confident in the decisions you're going to stay in the loop and check the performance and everything else so it's it's a powerful tool and it's like you know as people say it can be a great assistant to help you especially with all the workforce problems we've got at the moment and and uh, high volumes of cases complexity everything's on the up so we need something else to help us and this is one solution to, to getting there well, Ewan, thank you very much for what I think has really been a masterclass in <laughs> AI and pathology. I've, you know, I think everyone here's learned a great deal. It's been fantastic to see so many people attending your talk. Uh, thanks so much, and no I'm sure there'll thank be a you. lot of views of the recording. All the best. I'm sure you're going to be very busy in the years to come. Okay, thanks very much. Keep thanks, in touch uh, with the statewide biovac. Keep in touch. All right. With us. <laughs> all right, thanks again. Thanks everybody for uh, joining.